Hello and welcome back to Simon's Reigns. I'm Simon and today I'm going to give my on second thought on Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. So this is your spoiler warning before I get into the review. I am going to be talking about everything and the plot in this movie. So if you haven't seen yet and you don't want anything spoiled, you should click away now, go watch it, come back, and we'll talk about it then. So Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire is a 2005 film directed by Mike Newell. This is his first and only film directing in the Harry Potter franchise. And it is also the fourth installment in the Harry Potter franchise. As I previously mentioned, the first two were directed by Chris Columbus and the third one by Alfonso Cuaron, and this one was the first one directed by Mike Newell. If you're wondering what else this director has done because you've never heard of him, he's best known for Four Weddings and a Funeral, Donnie Brasco, and this. That's pretty much all he's actually done. He also did stuff like The Prince of Persia, and he helped with the Young Indiana Jones show that... He hasn't done a whole lot, and this is my favorite movie he's actually done. We of course have the main cast returning of Daniel Radcliffe, Rupert Grint, Emma Watson, Alan Rickman, but we also have the introduction of David Tennant, Ralph Fien, and Brendan Gleeson. Now I mentioned in the last one that The Prisoner of Azkaban is actually my favorite movie of the Harry Potter franchise, and I would actually say that The Goblet of Fire is my second favorite. Now I don't want to mislead you to think that this movie is anywhere close to perfect. None of them are. This one has several flaws, and I'll get into that, but this one is just really enjoyable to me. It also is at a specific cross-section in my life where it was the first movie of the Harry Potter franchise that I saw after reading the book. I saw the other three movies before reading the books. This one was the first one I had actually read the book first and then watched the movie, so I was most critical of the accuracy at that time. I mentioned previously that the new actor that portrayed Dumbledore in the third one moving forward was much more accurate than the previous actor and much more accurate to the book. And that's true, but in this one, he has a moment that everybody hates and everybody admits is not accurate at all. In case you don't know, this goblet decides which three, or in this case, four wizards will be competing in this dangerous contest. Whoever wins it gets all this glory and fame uh, for them and their school. And Harry Potter isn't supposed to be in this contest because you have to be in your last year at school. You have to be 17 years old. He's only 14 at the time, yet his name comes out the goblet. So everybody thinks that he cheated in some way and put his own name in, even though he didn't. Now, everybody wasn't supposed to include Dumbledore in this situation. Dumbledore asks Harry, calmly and collected, just as a precaution, did you put your name in that goblet? Like, everybody's accusing him, the Minister of Magic, all the other headmasters, Snape, everybody is mad at Harry, accusing him, thinking that he did it, and Dumbledore's the one that goes, hold on, let's actually ask him if he did it. That's not how it's portrayed in the movie at all. In the movie, Harry is whisked away to a room, away from everybody else, and then all of these people that I just mentioned come running and screaming into the room. Dumbledore grabs him, pushes him up against the wall, and screams in his face. Not exactly the same, is it? So, yes, I do approve of this casting, and I approve of how this actor portrays Dumbledore for the most part, but this is one of the worst moments in his portrayal. It's completely off-base. I don't really want to blame the actor so much. It's got to be a directing thing. That has to be a director or a writing choice. That isn't accurate at all. Also, this is the point in the franchise where it starts to get a little bit humorous, that whenever Voldemort or a bad guy gets involved, it's at the end of the school year, every time. You could make excuses or explain away why it had happened so far up until this point in the franchise. In the first one, that's just how it happened. In the second one, that's just kind of how it happened. You know, in both of those movies, Voldemort was trying to rise to power. He was very weak and he needed to gain power, so it took him that amount of time. In the third one, events just coincided on that day. I don't know. In the fourth one, you have a Death Eater living every day in close proximity to Harry Potter under the guise of Mad-Eye Moody, and he does nothing about it for the entire year. And then they have to coincide it with grabbing a port key to transporting to where Voldemort is so then they can have the ceremony there. That was stupid and pointless and it becomes laughable when you're like, okay, I could kind of ignore that everything always coincided exactly with the school year, but this is the point where I gave up and said, no, this is silly. <laughs> this shouldn't be happening like this. And that's also how it is in the fifth one and sixth one and seventh one, not so much because the school year becomes obsolete at that point. It, it just, it really is silly. It really is. Like, why didn't Barty Crouch Jr. 
do something to kill Harry, or at least capture Harry. He could have done this so easily. He was very well respected and trusted as Mad-Eye Moody. Now, I think in the book they do mention that some people didn't really trust him, or there was some sort of disbelief involved there and you had to build up that. I don't care. You're teaching a class with this guy. You're talking to him in private at times. You know him, he trusts you. You've got a connection there. You can whisk him away at any time. Now I get it. I get it. I know. You can't Apple write. You can't use port keys on Hogwarts grounds. There is a field of magic around it where you can't Apple write. You can't teleport in any way. You can't use certain magic on there because it's a safety charm. I get that. Convince him to go into the woods with you or convince him to go just off the boundary line with you. That's not very hard. One, you're a very well respected uh, horror. And also, Harry Potter is extremely oblivious and ignorant and gullible. All you'd have to do is compliment him in some way. Go, you know what? I think you're great. And you go, oh, really? And then you go, yes, let's walk over here and do something over here. You know what? I want to show you a spell that they don't want to teach you. Harry loves that stupid crap. He would have fallen for that immediately and you could have just whisked him away to Voldemort and then you would have had that whole thing right then and there. Granted, it wouldn't have changed a whole lot in the story because, I mean, he still would have had the wand bonding, the brother wands, and he would have escaped probably. But actually, he wouldn't have had a port key to get back, unless that's how they teleport the first time. Maybe, I don't know. But regardless, he might have died there. And that would have changed a lot. And even if it didn't change anything, at least it would have made more sense. Like, everything's so convenient. Okay, I got that out of the way. I'll talk about the rest of the movie now. So I was talking about accuracy and how I noticed accuracy a lot more in this one than previously. So leading up to this and watching the trailers as a kid and getting all excited for this movie, I noticed something about the maze immediately. It seemed kind of boring. So you've got these different tasks that you have to complete in the Triwizard Tournament. You've got these three wizards, like I said, you're all doing tasks and whoever does the tasks the best gets the best score, they win, uh, yada yada yada, praise and glory. So the last task is they have to run through a maze, uh, the hedge maze, to get to the middle where there is the cup that they have to grab and whoever grabs it first wins. Cool except for there's supposed to be spells and magical beasts and all of these things in the way, like a sphinx that asks you riddles and giant spiders and all this stuff. And in the movie, there's just vines that grab you. Okay, that's it. Weird. And they act like it's a big deal, like the walls change. Okay, cool, fair. Uh, and then there's the vines, there's the vines. <sighs> There's supposed to be a sphinx. I'm sorry, that's a lot cooler, okay? Like, what, did you run out of a budget? Or did you not have enough runtime? Or you thought it was cheesy? I don't know why they chose to go that route, but it was so disappointing when you've got something so big and grand in your mind, and then in actuality, it's something just, okay, it's a maze. Especially when the first two tasks are so much bigger than that already. So the first task, you have to steal a golden egg from a dragon. And then the second task, you have to swim to the bottom of the lake and get back a loved one from mermaids. Those are so much better and cooler and more interesting than just a hedge maze. Like, <laughs> a magical hedge maze. Like, you're building yourself up for failure in that situation. This is gonna be a lot more than 10 minutes because I... <laughs> There's a lot to talk about in this. And speaking of the other tasks, let's go back to them real quick. So first off, I'll actually, I'll just talk about the lake one real quick because I thought that one was really well done. There's not a whole lot to say about that because that was fairly accurate to the book in that representation and it was cool. I liked the design of the mermaids. I liked the whole uh, ambiance of the scene and the music and it was really cool. Done with that, awesome. They did the second task really well except for the fact that they found out about Gillyweed the wrong way. They found out about it from the wrong person, which was frustrating, but whatever, moving on. It simplified the script. I understand why they did it, but that's whatever. The first one. So you're supposed to steal this golden egg from a dragon. Now the egg has been given to the dragon, so the dragon now treats it as their own. They think it's one of their own eggs, and so they act like a mother. And so it's extremely hard and extremely difficult to get it away from them. 
and you don't really see in the movie how the other ones do it. You hear about it in the book, but regardless, how Harry does it is he summons his broom and out maneuvers and flies the dragon around. And okay, that's stupid. And let me explain why. Harry is supposed to be a great broom rider. Okay, I get it. He's a great, a great seeker. He's one of the best ever. He's phenomenal. He's a pro. Awesome. He's the Michael Phelps of broom riding. All right, best in the world. Um, I don't think Michael Phelps can outswim a shark in any stretch of the imagination. So why in the world can a human who's adapted to learn how to fly on a broom, how are they supposed to outmaneuver something that was born to fly? That that is how they move. That is how, that's their whole existence is flying. That's idiotic. That's stupid. That's like saying, okay, well, Usain Bolt, he's really fast. He can run really fast, so we're going to have him outrun this cheetah right now. It's like, yeah, he's the best in the world at what he does, but when you get an animal that is bred for that, that is de designed specifically for that one thing, there's no way you as a human, even though you've adapted to do it really well, there's no way you can do that. Like, he outmaneuvers it. So much so that it literally can't for some reason. All right. <clears throat> so one of the things he does is he flies around the castle and the dragon's flying like it's drunk for some reason. Maybe it's had its wings clipped or something. That would explain a lot. But he comes around to this bridge and he flies like he's going to hit the bridge and then last second doesn't. And so then you see the dragon fly up to the bridge, freak out like, oh, I'm going to hit it try to maneuver over it, hit the bridge, and fall to its presumed death, I guess? That was one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. The dragon came to almost a full complete halt, elevated itself above the bridge, but then fell down and hit the bridge, and then fell off into nothingness. Do I have to explain why that's stupid? Any more than I have? Because I feel like I've fully explained this. It shouldn't have happened. It's like, uh, I don't know. I'll bring up the cheetah analogy again. So you're, you're sprinting for your life because there's a cheetah running behind you. It's gaining ground fast. And then there's a, there's a telephone pole. So you're running at the telephone pole. And then you quickly, you grab it and you spin around it because you were juking out the cheetah. And then the cheetah sees the telephone pole, screeches to a halt, and then starts running and hits into the pole and knocks itself out. That's essentially what happened in this movie. <laughs> yeah, it's dumb to say the least. Anyway, all those complaints out the way because there are a lot. Uh, those are the main ones though. It's the stupidity involved in the tasks and then, you know, the just normal stupidity of everything's so convenient. Beyond that, there's a lot of really good in this movie that I enjoyed a lot. And I know it's not all completely accurate. Like, I know a lot of people complain, like, the, the, you've got the manly school that's all guys, and then you've got the feminine school that's all girls, and it wasn't supposed to be like that in the book, and I get that. A lot of people complain about that. It doesn't really bother me that much. It was just a creative choice. It's inaccurate, but it didn't affect anything to me. I didn't care, really. I kind of question why they did that, other than, like, the creators were so afraid to portray feminine guys and masculine girls for some reason, which is stupid if that's the case. Or maybe they just thought it was simpler and easier to show masculine men and feminine women, and that was the easiest thing to do. They didn't feel like wasting any time on explaining anything, but it really wasn't that complicated, and the fact that they went out of their way to change it seems silly and stupid, but it doesn't bother me, but I have to bring it up because it does bother so many people. But aside from those changes that I've brought up, I really do enjoy this a lot. Once again, we've taken the change that Alfonso Cuaron started in the third one and continued on in that general direction. If this is the original plot line and it's going in a straight line, Alfonso Cuaron changed it in like almost a 90 degree angle. And then Mike Newell's version kind of shifted it back this way. So it's still very different than the original, but he met somewhere in the middle of the two versions. And 
it's really good. It's it's safer than what Alfonso Cuaron did, but it's still edgier and still more interesting and still more unique than what we got from Chris Columbus in his two films. So I really do appreciate his style there. He really did try to create an atmosphere that felt like a whole new world as far as going bringing in that supposed wizard band that they had at the ball. I it didn't care for it. They sounded a lot cooler in the book than they were in the movie, but at least he tried to portray what this would look like. It's hard to take everything J.K. Rowling throws at the wall and makes it make it into something cool and actually real. Like you've got so many clashing things about this, like wizard dress robes and a punk band. It's like such a weird combination that it's like, are we really trying to make something real or are we trying to make something weird? I feel like J.K. Rowling was just trying to be weird and these movies were trying to make it real and cool. And I think this movie, for the most part, succeeded in that. And once again, we have these characters and these actors further grow in their roles and become even better and more interesting. I think this is probably the peak of the kid acting in this movie. I'll get into the other ones later and why they fell off so bad. Part of it's directing, part of it is behind the scenes stuff. But in this one, I feel it's really Daniel Radcliffe's and Rupert Grint's and Emma Watson's and most of these kids peak as far as the Harry Potter franchise goes. They've done great works outside of this franchise, but this is, I believe, the, the peak as far as the Harry Potter franchise is concerned. And then as for the story, I really do think this story is really interesting. I enjoy the idea. I know it's silly, the portrayal of having it all happen at the end of the year, but still, the idea of it is cool where you have this competition where Harry gets snuck into it by this third party and then he gets whisked away by winning it going to this other place entirely. So you've got this whole kid-friendly, uh, exciting thing like competition that gets quickly changed into something more grounded and dark and adult in there is a serial killer trying to kill you. And it was a great bridge movie where you went from, all right, this is no longer the kid franchise, this is the young adult adult franchise, where the third one did have some dark elements, but Altogether, it was still very kiddish. This one was like, we've got kid elements. Oh wait, now this is the adult side of Harry's life where he becomes constantly under attack. He becomes the focal point of a terrorist attack and essentially a war. And this is that moment. This is the moment where the franchise shifts officially. It also has a great moment in it where Cedric Diggory dies. That's not because it's Robert Pattinson and I don't like him. <laughs> that wasn't rewarding me. Actually, Robert Pattinson, I think, does perfectly fine in this movie. I saw this before anything to do with Twilight. I saw him and was like, perfectly fine. He's a little pale for, you know, what I thought in my head when I read about Cedric Diggory, but you know what? Cool. I like it. I approve. And then his death scene is so powerful. You've got Harry and Cedric returning to the crowd, and as far as all of them know, they've just been in the maze, uh, which has to be really boring to watch, by the way, at least how it's portrayed in the movie. I don't know if it was the same in the book. I haven't read the book in a long time. But essentially, <laughs> in the movie, they just watch them go into the maze, and then that's it. Kind of the same thing with going into the water, too. And in Harry's case, same thing with the dragon, because he flies away. So I hope they didn't pay much to go to these events, because they didn't see Anyway, you've got Cedric and Harry return with the portkey, which is the cup. So all the crowd knows is that the game is supposedly over and it looks like it's a tie. It's so exciting to them. Everybody's cheering and nobody realizes yet that Cedric is dead. And then the first person to realize is his dad. And I'm getting goosebumps and I'm getting emotional talking about this because it is such a powerful scene. It's so well done and it's so sad and it really... I know it's a movie, but just the portrayal by the actor that plays his dad, I have to look him up. I don't know who it is, but it's so well done. His name is Jeff Rowell. He's a British actor. I don't know much about him. He doesn't seem to have done a whole lot that I'm familiar with, but his portrayal in that moment is just so good and so heart-wrenching. You've got all of this loud cheering and you've got this happy music and then you just, you hear him scream for his son and, and it's a uh, cold stop as everybody realizes almost simultaneously that something is horribly wrong and it's such a powerful scene it's one of the most powerful scenes i've seen in just 
and movies in general. I mean, I'm not just talking like young adult teen fiction movies or whatever. I'm talking just movies. Like this scene hits hard and it's so well done, especially if you're a sucker for like son father moments in movies. Like this hits you hard. He's it's such a good portrayal by this actor. The directing in this moment was phenomenal. Uh, like it feels real when I'm talking about it. Like it feels like I'm talking about somebody who actually lost their kid and it's really sad. So kudos to them because you're making me sad talking about a fictional character dying. So good for you guys. That's how you know it's real because like I'm getting sad thinking about something that's not real. It's that Good writing, good directing, good acting. That's all I can say about that. So yeah, this movie has a lot of great moments in it. There's a lot to complain about, certainly more than there was in the third one, but it's still a more exciting movie than the first two. It's more interesting. I care about these characters more. There's more interesting things going on. And so altogether, I think that this is my second favorite one because of all of that. Yes, it's imperfect, but it was cool and creepy like the third one, but still, light and exciting at times so i think all around it is yes the second best one i don't hate really any of the harry potters except for maybe one which i'll get i'll talk about but for the most part i feel like this middle section with the third and the fourth one really was the peak of the franchise and i'll talk more about the other ones in the following videos but i just want to say right now that <laughs> it doesn't get better than these two, at least in my opinion. I'll get to those though. So yeah, that's what I thought. I really do enjoy this one a lot, but there is honestly several flaws that you have to kind of just ignore and close your eyes for. But I can because the rest of it's enjoyable enough. And so yeah, I like it. What do you guys think though? Let me know in the comments below. And of course, don't forget to like, share. And if you're new here, subscribe. Thanks guys. Bye.